Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank God for Jesus, and thank God for your tuning in this evening for Wednesday Night Discipleship Development Project. I am Pastor Mary Washington, and I'm greeting those of you from around the world as we are serving both the local community and the World Wide Web. I pray that you have prepared your heart to hear what it is that God has to say today. Tonight's service will go forth in two parts. I will come with a beginning message and encouragement, and then I will tag Elder Lewis, and he'll come with the second portion as we're coming from our Willing Workers book. I'm thankful to God for this opportunity to be challenged in this hour with his glory and his mercy in spite of the things that come against us. You know, so many times we are experiencing things that could cause us to quit or to give up or to feel like it's just impossible. But I encourage you tonight to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And so as we go forth tonight, we're going to begin talking about our believing God because it's necessary for you to believe in him and on him in order that you will be able to walk according to his will and his way. And that's the objective, that we walk in the will and the way of God, regardless of what the circumstances of life that are coming against us, we rest in the place of being the victor. I thank God for each of you that are here, every member of Feed My Sheep Church of God in Christ and every believer from around the world. And even those of you who may not have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior at this point, my prayer is that by the end of this message, you will have been convicted in your spirit and convinced that going with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the way to go. And that your question will be, what must I do to be saved? And we will answer those questions for you. You can contact us at Church at gmail.com. I give you that information now. So if you want to write me to ask any question about anything that you hear said, or any question that you might have concerning anything in this Christian walk, certainly feel free to contact us and we will respond with an answer that is Bible-based that we find in the Holy Bible. To begin our studies, we're going to first look into the book of Mark, the ninth chapter. I was thinking on that as we were preparing to come on air and God was speaking to, to me several things. And I want to tell you what the subject is for tonight. The subject is, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, I believe, as I've studied the word, heard the voice of God, and even pondered some things myself, that this is a message that every person under the sound of my voice can receive and be blessed by. Because God wants us to operate in a place of believing him so that we will experience the manifestation of, of the things that God wants to do in our life. And so I want to encourage you to consider all that is being said, believing what the word of God has already declared and decreed on our behalf, that we are more than conquerors to him because he loved us, that we are the head and not the tail, and that we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Before we start this portion, I want to go before the throne of God to receive his mercy and his help for our time of need because we need him to receive the revelation right now. Come on and go with me to the throne zone. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come praising you for your goodness and your mercy toward us, being so grateful that you have saved us and delivered us from all that is evil. It is you, Lord, that keepeth us. You are the Lord our God, and there is none like you. We come blessing your holy name, thanking you for this opportunity to sit in your presence and to receive a word that will remove the burdens and destroy the yokes in our life. I pray for your sons and daughters, your children around this world, that they will be delivered and made free and walk in the victory because they believe what's already been done for them in your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Father, we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Out of the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, we're going to look at some things that God was speaking to me. And he sent me through this passage. And I'm really just going to read through this passage expeditiously because I don't want to delay time. But I want you to hear the whole story of what is going on in this passage. Uh, get your Bible so that you too can read along with me so that you'll be convicted that this word of God is true. One of the things that came to my mind earlier this week as I was speaking to one of the ministers that I labor with is, what is the point of me serving a God that I don't believe. 
Now that's a good question for all of us because many would profess that they do believe and they'll argue and be frustrated and aggravated sometimes and even agitated because their faith in God is questioned. And yet many times the things that you are doing or the things that you are not doing shows that you're really not trusting God. And so our desire and hope is that you would trust in the Lord when you hear this word on tonight. And one of the things he spoke to me is that God will give you help to overcome your unbelief. We're going to read this scripture out of the New Living Translation. And you can, in your spare time, you can go and read it out of the um, the King James Version. But I'm using the New Living Translation because it's a layman's term. And I want you to get what is being said. I want you to see the scenario of what is going on. What we're going to look at here is an appearingly hopeless situation. It appears that this child's father has no might and ability. But you will also see within the context of the scripture that his might and ability for the thing that he needed to come to pass rests in him believing in Jesus Christ as able to do it. And this is where we fall short many times because we don't believe in Jesus Christ as being able to do it. In fact, oftentimes we look at our limited ability. And if the truth be told, we are very limited quite frequently. And so we've got to open up our eyes to see what has been done for us in Christ Jesus. And I pray that as I read through the scripture, you will begin to see what I'm talking about. And then I'll come back and give you the revelation that God has given me. Beginning in verses 1 through 15, Jesus' disciples are busy about their business of ministry, and there's a man that comes to them with his son, and with the issue he don't have an answer to. He don't know what to do. Uh, it's been plaguing his son for a long time, and we'll see this as we read in the scripture, and he's at his wit's end. But he's heard about Jesus and his disciples. And so he brings his son and he comes to the disciples to see what they can do about it. The Bible tells us in verse 14, it says, When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. Now, this is Jesus and some of his disciples. The other disciples were already there. And now they are coming where they are and they see this large crowd surrounding them. And there are other people, spectators, they talk about the teachers of religious law, whether they're Pharisees, Sadducees, or whomever they are, they are spectators and they're arguing against the disciples. The Bible says in verse 15, when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. Why would they do that? Because Jesus' history, his his works had gotten around, his reputation had gotten around the community for them to know that he was the healer, he was the deliverer, he was the provider in whatever way the persons needed when they came into Jesus' presence and they believed Jesus manifested whatever they need, even to 5,000 men and women and children being fed with a, a small amount of fish and bread. And so they've heard these miracles and things that Jesus has already done. And so they're running to Jesus to greet him because they have been listening to what was going on. And so when Jesus comes in verse 16 in the New Living Translation, it says, what is all this arguing about? That was Jesus' statement. He saw his disciples surrounded by people. He saw all the confusion going on. And he said, what is all of this arguing about? In the King James Version, it says, what question ye with them? In other words, why are you asking them these questions? And so Jesus saw that his disciples were under fire. So as a good leader, he's not only stepping up to protect them from uh, any type of shame, but also to uh, give the answer to whatever is needed that the, the crowd is looking for. Jesus asked, he said, one of, and then one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and become rigid. 
So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Now, I want you to focus on what is being said now, right now. I don't want you to focus on what the enemy is doing to the little boy, because a lot of times we'll go away from hearing what this, how the situation is and what needs to be done to looking at the circumstance based on how we feel about it. This man has brought his son to Jesus. Jesus is not there at the time. And he's expecting that his disciples, who also have cast out demons, laid hands on the sick and raised the dead, would be able to work this work in his son's life. But he testifies to Jesus that he brought his son to them and so that they could heal him. And then he began to talk about what condition the son is in. I want to say to you tonight that no matter what the condition is in your life, no matter how difficult it is, how impossible it is, you can put it in this very circumstance. You are a person that need an answer to an issue that you have no power over, you have no control over. It's driving you. And so this is where we see the man as he comes to Jesus. And he goes on to explain to him that it throws him vitally to the ground and then he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and become rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Here's another thing that we need to look at as we look at this lesson today. As disciples of Christ, in our discipleship development uh, project, as we're training to be like Jesus, ought we not be able to cast out demons? Ought we not be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover? Ought we not be able to do the greater works that the scripture declared that we are to do? I'm bringing this to emphasis because there's so many people today who are not concerned about being filled with the Holy Spirit, who is not concerned about walking in the power of God, who are not concerned about how their family, their prosperity is being infiltrated by evil spirits. And we will see as we go on that this child had been infiltrated by an evil spirit. Again, I don't want you to just focus on the child. It is a sad thing that there is a child that is going through and the parent don't know what to do and the enemy is the one who has launched the attack against him. But I want you to know that this is not something that is uncommon. This is very common, very natural. Many things that science study to say with all these various theories like Freud had of things happening when a child is five or six years old and th things of this sort. These are evidences that children have been infiltrated by evil spirits and they don't know what to do about it. And oftentimes it's much, they're much younger than five year old as the theorists would say. But we're not depending on the theorists as science knew it, uh, the research and the surveys. We're depending on the word of God, who, which is therapy for our situations, whatever it is. See, this man needed an answer, and Jesus was the answer. He was the therapy. He was the healing bomb for this situation. His disciples could have or should have, and Jesus is going to tell them why they didn't, but we look, even in them doing the work, they're still going to have to do it through the power that Jesus gave them. They could not lean to their own understanding. They couldn't be in a nonchalant place. They couldn't go away from being consecrated and do the work. They had to stay in the alignment of walking in the power and the authority that is given the believer to work the work of Jesus Christ. And so let's go on here with the story. After the man said, but they couldn't, the Bible says in verse 19, the New Living Translation, Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, some would think that Jesus was speaking to everybody was there that was there. I do not believe that Jesus was speaking to everyone that was there. He was speaking to those who were following him that were to be believers. But you're going to see that he's going to challenge their faith as we go through the scripture because they did not believe. They were standing in the position of believers. They were notarized as believers, but they were not operating in the power. This brings us to us in our culture today. As we are professing to be believers, we are not walking in the power. And when I say we, I'm talking about the whole. Without a doubt, there are some, but it's few and far between. And we need to come to the place that we can walk in the power and the authority. We will see in this scripture how Jesus told them what the issue was. 
And then you'll know what you must examine yourself to make sure that you align with the word of God so you can operate in the power of God. It was Jesus that said, the work I do, you shall do also in greater works. We live in a time, a dispensation, a generation where people are not looking to operate in the power of Jesus Christ. In fact, most people do nothing to be tested except talking. And talking alone does not manifest the glory of God. Because anybody can talk, anybody can emulate, anybody can act like. But the Bible talks frequently about in word and in deed. So it ought to be some actions showing up in your life as a believer that you are walking in the power of God. If you don't see any action that says I'm walking in the power and authority of God, you want to question yourself, am I filled with the spirit of God? Because the Bible said that you will have Holy Ghost and power. The power is to be activated to do the things that God has ordained you to do as you continue to be witnesses unto him in this earth realm. So Jesus speaks to the people and he says, you faithless people in the King James Version, it says, oh, faithless generation, you people right now, this generation, this dispensation right now, you are faithless. And I can say in this hour that we're living right now, this is exactly what we're seeing. Jesus was speaking to his disciples that he had given a work to do. He is the one that conditioned them uh, uh, commissioned them rather, as well as conditioned them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though the Spirit hadn't come to abide in each man, Jesus had given them authority. And when they went in his authority, they were able to do what he told them to do. So why could they not do this on this day? I'm glad you asked. Stay with me. I'm going to tell you as Jesus told them, and you are going to examine yourself as I have examined myself again and again when I go into the word to see if I am where I think I am. You know, the Bible tells us not to be heady or high-minded, not to be lifted up within ourselves, thinking that we are somewhere where we're not. Many people are professing to be filled with the Holy Ghost and have no power, no authority. That's what that power is, having authority over situations, over circumstances. Now, it can't be just anything you want, but it can be anything that aligns with the will of God. And so you make your request known of him. You go to him to walk in this power, in this earth realm, even to be witnesses unto him, for people to be saved. You need the power of God, God's will, working on your behalf so you can draw others to him because no man can draw, draw can be drawn except the spirit draws him. So you can't just do it of your free will and because you know how to talk. You need the power of the Holy Ghost working in you and you trusting as you utilize this power that God will manifest it through you because you know that's his will. So let's go on further. This is a very powerful teaching I'm talking about, but I've got about 10 more minutes to, to bring you to the conclusion of the matter until the next time. But I want you to understand that this message is sent and meant to challenge your faith, to challenge do you believe. And that's why the subject is, I believe, help my unbelief. Because there are many people today who are professing Christians who do not take on that mindset and they do not walk in power. And so there's something missing because their life is not representing who they say they are in Christ Jesus. They're simply talking and not walking. In verse 19, Jesus says, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So Jesus is going to exhibit to everybody watching, including his disciples, that this can be done. So it's not a situation that it can't be done. And it's very important because, again, remembering Jesus has said you would do the greater works. You would do the works he did and greater works. And he's showing you here it can be done. This is just another miracle manifested through the power of God as God has placed his power in every person who believes on Jesus Christ and in what Jesus Christ has given them. So the Bible declares, it says, so they brought the boy... But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. So it tells us in verse 20 that there is an evil spirit in him. There's an evil spirit in a child. Now, what age this child is, it is not revealed to us. But oftentimes in scripture, when you find the word boy, 
It's not talking about a teenager. It, they're they're going to use youth or young men or something of that sort if they're talking about a teenager. So we're going to believe that this was a younger child. And then Jesus asked the question. Also, I want to say this, that many people who see this writhing and foaming at the mouth, they they conclude that it is epilepsy. While those are some of the things that show up in this sickness of epilepsy, there's no way that we can be assured of this because there's nothing to substantiate that at this time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that there is an unclean spirit that because the scripture substantiates that, that the evil spirit is in this child. So we're not going to call it a sickness or a disease. And the truth be told, let's consider this. If we start calling that a sickness or a disease, then we'd have to look at every sickness and disease that we experience as an evil spirit that has shown up. So we're not going to draw that conclusion. Our conclusion is going to be drawn from the scripture. But we do know that it debilitated him. It caused him to do things that would not be common or normal for a child to do. And so we're not going with the, the diagnosis. We're going with the answer to the issue. Glory to God. It says here in verse 21, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. Now, little boy, for us in our Western civilization, primarily starts at two years old. Could have been younger, could have been a little older. But the scripture emphasized since he was in the King James of a child. And we know when they were looking for Jesus, talking about a little child, he was two years old, according to scripture. So we're going to see through here and through this, uh, this confirmation of scripture that he was probably about two years old, give or take a few months, and, and that this started happening to him. Now, one of the things I want to stop right here and say, there's a lot of people who have children or who you yourself or family members or parents have been infiltrated with an evil spirit. So don't look at this as though it's something that you can't deal with because you deal with it when it abides in you, when it's in your household, when it's in your relationships, when it's on your job. You deal with these evil spirits who work through people all the time. So there's nothing to fear here, but there is much to do here. And this is where we usually miss it because we don't do anything about it. And the reason that most people don't do anything about it is because they won't acknowledge it for fear. For fear that they acknowledge that there's an evil spirit, they don't know what to do. Well, this man didn't know what to do either, except to go to Jesus. And that's what you do. And if you are a born-again believer, what you do, you go to Jesus with the authority and the power that he's given you, and you go against this evil spirit that is within yourself, within uh, Jesus, excuse me, within your children, within your grandchildren, within your parents, whomever it is. You go against this evil spirit in the power of Jesus the Christ. He's already given you power over all the power of your enemy. That an evil spirit is your enemy that works through an individual. Remember the scripture tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So whomever that person is, perhaps it's your spouse, perhaps it's your sibling, Perhaps it's your next door neighbor and you, there's always something going on and they're going against you. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So evil is behind these things that you're experiencing in your life, no matter what the environment is. And this is why it's so important that you believe. There's a lot of people, the greater number of people, and I would go as far as saying 95% of people who are professing Christians do not believe that they are, can be infiltrated with an evil spirit once they're saved. They do not believe that they have power and authority over an evil spirit. We know this because they don't use it in their own lives. They don't use it in their family's lives. They don't, they don't use the power that's been given. We can look at the examples of Jesus and how he used the power the same Holy Ghost power, that resurrection power, and we will know that we can and ought to be using that same power. Many people run away from statements like that, but it's the truth, and I won't take it back, and I won't be quiet. So Jesus asked the man, he said, how long has this been happening? And the man replied, since he was a little boy. Verse 22 says, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us 
if you can. Now that tells you right there, the man that came to Jesus that brought his boy was very much in the same condition many of us are when we go to a doctor or to somewhere where we're trying to get some help. This situation is overwhelming. We don't know what to do and we don't know if the other person can do anything. Herein lies the difference. Jesus is able to do exceeding abundantly above what you or I could ask or think. So we've got to stop relying on our human wisdom. We've got to stop relying on human people as the answer to the issue. They are needing the same Jesus in their situations that you and I need. And we need Jesus to manifest himself in us. And he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But we've looked away to our hopelessness and helplessness based on what's going on in the world system rather than depending on the Lord. That's why Jesus said, how long am I going to have to endure you? You face a generation. Because the people that have been watching him, seeing him, and were professing that he is uh, the Christ, these same people were not doing what it is he had given them authority to do. Would that be us today? Would that be the church? Would that be the body of Christ? Yes, it would be. And we must take responsibility to fulfill the will of God. This is what we're talking about. Help my unbelief. I believe you're a Christian. You profess to be a Christian. You professing to be saved. You're saying you believe. So the question is now why you are you not using your authority? That means you need the Lord to help your unbelief. This man wasn't a professing Christian, but he came there as a believer. He opened up his own mouth and said he was, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, after uh, declaring what this, this evil spirit did, he asked the Lord Jesus to have mercy on them and help them. But he said, if you can. I find that many people today, that's the mindset. If Jesus can. They look at what they feel like and what they're going through and what's coming against them and what they want to do and they don't see a way out. And, and they don't think that he can. But the God I serve is able to do what we can do. With you it's impossible, but with God it is not. And we've got to position ourselves in him by, first of all, before you do anything else, you got to believe. Before you work the work of the ministry, you got to believe. Before you're able to be the husband or the wife that you would want to be, you got to believe. Before you can be the obedient child to God or the obedient child to your parents, you got to believe. You've got to believe that the things that God has set in order are so. No doubts, no fears, no worries. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. In verse 23, Jesus speaks to the man, and I'm going to read this out of the King James Version. It says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Jesus made a direct statement. He, it, this wasn't something debatable. The man was wondering if Jesus could, and he put that in, in the sentence to let him know that he, you know, that possibly he could not do it. His disciples, he was probably discouraged, uh, no doubt, because the disciples who had been heard or rumored to have the power was not able to do it. And many times the church get a bad rep, the power of God, the Holy Spirit get a bad rep because there are people who are professing to have the power who are not able to do it. But this man speaks to Jesus and he said, and Jesus speaks back to him and says, what do you mean if I can? Now, that's a New Living Translation giving us to understand just a little better. What do you mean if I can? And I went back to the New Living Translation because I want to ask you as a believer, what do you mean if he can? What do you mean if he will? He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What do you mean you want to be healed and you're thinking he won't? He's already said by his stripes you were healed. So that's not something that's debatable or questionable except in your mind. And so that puts you in the same place this man was. And we find many people being in that place today, even thinking it's an extraordinary thing when someone else can really believe God. But the truth of the matter is, as a believer, that's where we all have to come to. This again brings us back to our course and our uh, topic. I believe, help thou my unbelief. Lord, help me to come out of this place of unbelieving or not believing you. Jesus said, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. 
You know, some of us don't think that's true. But if you look at some of the things that's going on in the world with people who do not know the Lord at all, but they believe there's a power in faith, in belief, believing that enables a person to do beyond what they naturally could do. And it shows up sometimes in businesses, sometimes in ministries, sometimes in health. You know, people who who didn't exercise at all for half of their life or maybe even to their aging part of their life. And then they start believing they can and they start exercising and becoming physically fit, defying all the odds and all the testimonies because they believed. And they're not believing on Jesus, but they're having faith that they can do this. And God has given to every man a measure of faith by which they can use to manifest things in their life. So there are people who are not saved, who are manifesting things. They're not godly things. They're not things that are going to keep them in, a, in the right place with God or in uh, send them to heaven, but their things are manifested in this earth realm for them because they believe. What it would be like if every believer would lay hold on believing Jesus that way. What a mighty, mighty act of God we would see in this earth realm in this dispensation. God wants to be glorified in us. Let me go on here as we're going to, about to close out. The Bible says in verse 24, the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. You know, I have been around the church many years. And what I find out is once people start professing they're saved, they quit speaking out of their mouth, their weaknesses. They quit saying, I'm weak. I don't really believe this. I'm not really able to handle this. See, your knowing that you don't believe it should cause you to rely on the Lord the more. Your knowing that you're not strong enough by yourself should cause you to call on the Lord for his strength. But what I find is people are doing the opposite of and not pressing into what God has given them, power over all the power of the enemy. We have been given all things that pertain to life and God is in Christ Jesus. So you have been given the authority. You've been authorized as a believer to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's God's power. But you must believe. It's according to your faith. So be it unto you. When you go on to read this story, you'll see that Jesus began to speak to the situation. He's speaking to the people and he's speaking to the man and the little boy. In verse 25 says, when Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers were growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Do y'all know that many of us are afraid to be as bold as Jesus was? Jesus spoke to situation in front of the people, in front of the father, in front of the little boy, in front of his father, and he commanded that spirit come out and not to go back to that child again. See, we've got to have holy boldness. We've got to say what it is that God has said and stand on his word. The Bible says, then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Hallelujah. I just thought about the song that we used to sing and I mentioned it the other day, but it bears repeating. That if he has to reach way down, Jesus will pick you up. But most, you're still going to have to furnish the faith of reaching out to him when he picks you up. You've got to furnish the faith. When Jesus spoke to this little boy, it appeared that the situation was over. When he, when he spoke to that demon to leave, it appeared that the situation for the child was over. He appeared to be dead. There are some things that are going on in your life right now that appears to be dead. But you've got to speak the word because you've been given authority as kings and priests in the kingdom of God. You've got to speak the word in faith in what Christ has done. That it will come to pass as you believe it, as you see it. The Bible tells us in Mark 11 and 22 that we can speak to the mountain and say, Be thou removed and cast in the sea and not doubt in our heart. 
but believing that those things that we say shall come to pass, we'll have what we say. Many of us have quoted that scripture, but few of us have believed it. And mostly it's because of what it looks like, what's coming against us, what it feels like, how difficult it is. You could probably write a laundry list of reasons to say why it can't manifest because it looks so impossible. But as I said earlier, I, I'll say it again. With you, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The Bible said Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that devil, that evil spirit that comes from the devil? It says that evil spirit here. See, they anticipated that they could walk in that power and that they could cast out that evil spirit. And so they were wondering, if Jesus cast it out, he's given us his power. Why come we couldn't cast it out? And Jesus said, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Now, this is the New Living Translation. The King James Version, it said, this kind come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, why does it say fasting in the, in the King James Version and not in the New Living Translation? If you would do the study of the Israelite people and how things were done in that hour, as we should well do today, the praying always was coupled with fasting. What it emphasizes is a need to be consecrated to the Lord. Be in a position so that the power can come upon you. Jesus did not tell them that they couldn't cast out the demons. Then he did not tell them that they couldn't do the work he did. He told them the issue was this kind can't be cast out only by prayer. What is prayer? Communicating with God. Listening to him and speaking to him. Not just talking, but actually communicating with God. <clears throat> Jesus said that's what it takes to cast out a demon that has infiltrated. And this is why you couldn't do it. This is why we can't do it today because we're not living in a place of consecration. We're not living in a place where the glory would show up in our lives. We're not living in a place where we're leaning and depending on the Lord to empower us to fulfill his will. See, you've got to have a mind to want to lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, or to do whatever the other work is that it is that God would have you to do. It takes a mind of Christ. We're going to stop right there and just take a brief uh, uh, intercession and we're going to have Sister Lewis is going to share with us our uh, announcements and then we're being followed by uh, Elder Lewis. Glory to God. Just to let us know what's going on here at Feed My Sheep Ministry on the World Wide Web and other places that we're going. I'm giving her a few minutes to get there because I hadn't told her she'd be interjecting that but that's how we're making our transitions. For those of you that may need to get a glass of water and come right back, do that really quickly because we're going to give you two minutes to get that done. And she's going to give the announcement in that time frame so that we will know what to anticipate as you follow this ministry, whether you're live here in Irving or around the DFW Metroplex or you over the world wide web, you can join us for any of these labors of ministry. God bless you, Sister Lewis. Come on and share with us. Amen. God bless you. Every Sunday at 9 a.m., we join together via uh, the World Wide Web for International Sunday School. This is where we have opportunities to be one accord in the church of God in Christ across the land. And that's at 9 a.m. Immediately following, we go. We have morning worship experience at 11 a.m. This is when the old adultery of the world is a word is heralded by none other than the prophet Mary Washington, the pastor of Feed My Sheep Ministries Church of God in Christ. In addition to that, we have a uh, we have a praise break in there, and we just enjoy ourselves in the Lord. On every Wednesday night, we meet for discipleship development program. This is where we have an opportunity to come together, share in the word, learn and grow, and also ask us questions via the chat or by going to our website at fmsmgospelnetwork.org. There you can go in and, and put your prayer request in by submitting it at fmsmchurch at gmail.com or you can follow the link on the website again at fmsm fmsmgospelnetwork.org. 
We also want to let you know that uh, we are here for you. If you need prayer or have any type of situations going on in your life, you can contact contact us at fmsmchurch at gmail.com. But also, there's a plethora of help available at our website. If uh, No matter what the circumstance or situation is, if it's about your relationship, you can find it there. If it's about your spiritual health, you can find answers there. If it's about your mental health, answers are also there. If it's about your uh, physical health, answers are there. So everything you need, you can find at fmsmgospelnetwork.org. The final thing that I want to uh, say before I uh, turn it over into the hands of Elder Lewis is that we have uh, a way that you can sow into this ministry. In order for any ministry to go forward, we need the help of the people in, in general, so those that we labor for and among. And so we're asking you to be guilty of sowing into this ministry so that we can continue the work of God. You can go to our, uh, our website, and on there, there is an app called Give LaFi. On that app, all you simply have to do is follow the link, and it'll take you to our ministry, and you can sow a seed that would help bless us in the now and in the later. On that site, you can also download it on your cell phone. You can go to GiveLify through this app, put in your email, and it will give you the steps, put in your uh, card, and each, anytime the Lord moves on you, doing our service or when you're not in service with us, you can just go to that app and submit a, uh, uh, an offering unto the Lord through that app that will support this ministry and the amen. communities that we serve. So amen, we, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Lewis. We're going to move on further into the lesson tonight as time is winding down toward the, toward the closing of our broadcast. We want Elder Lewis to go forth. He's going to be going forth about 30 minutes and want you to hear and take your notes. And especially those of you who are part of Feed My Sheep Ministries, we want you to take your notes so we can talk about it after the uh, broadcast has gone off. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Washington. Uh, this evening's uh, lesson topic, uh, saying yes and meaning yes. Uh, this is uh, lesson four. The lesson text is 2 Corinthians 1, 16 through 20. Um, our memory verse for tonight is uh, from the King James Version, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and 18. But as God is true... Our word towards you was not yea and nay. Uh, also reading from the NIV, it says, But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. Our lesson aim for this evening. The aim of this lesson is to encourage believers to say what they mean and mean what they say, especially when they say yes. So I want to cover... Uh, a couple of key terms that are talked about in this lesson. Uh, one of the words is corrupt. And the meaning of that word from our book that we're coming from says debased, rendered impure, changed to a worse state. And I went and found some other words that correlate with the word corrupt. And those words are immoral, unethical dishonest, crooked, and shady. So these words tell me that as a believer, uh, we should never be speaking in a scenario of any of those words. Those words, those thoughts, those motives should never be a part of our speech. Amen. Um, communication, means of connection between people or places. Again, the topic is saying that we are saying yes and meaning yes. So there is no in-between. There is no gray area. Edifying. Building up in Christian knowledge generally and in particularly in moral and religious knowledge in faith and holiness. A few other words that I found was enlighten and enriching. Mm -hmm. So if we're not speaking to help someone in a situation, to bring somebody up, to enlighten someone on uh, uh, the word of God or enriching someone's life, then we should not be trying to, as I said, be speaking in the corrupt manner. 
We shouldn't be trying to bring a person down. We shouldn't be talking about a person. We shouldn't be dishonest. We shouldn't be crooked in those instances. Mm -hmm. And grace, spiritual instruction, improvement, and edification. So our introduction uh, says the Bible has a whole lot to say about how we should communicate with one another. Consider the following scriptures. And I have them in the New Leaven translation as well. Proverbs 15 and 1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Ephesians 4 and 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And then Colossians 4 and 6. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. And so as I continue to uh, think about the words that we, the key words for this lesson, and then even going into the scripture, the word is telling us how we are to talk, how we are to have conversations with other people, how we should be speaking among uh, the brethren, how we should be speaking that would draw somebody that has not given their life or that's not saved into the fold, uh, having something to offer that would draw a, that would help draw a person in. Uh, as I as I thought about in this in this particular lesson, a couple of different things from the perspective that the scripture tells us that life and death lies within the power of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And so that also considers how we're speaking to other people. Amen. As well. And uh, as my wife, uh, Missionary Lewis, always talks about when she says she listens to what it is that a person is saying, the words that are coming out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you lie, it's a lie. There's mm -hmm. no in between. There's no, and the scripture will, the lesson goes into this, but there's no such thing as a white lie. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as a little lie. Right. And we'll continue as we go on. Um. Each of the above verses contains loads of wisdom and practical steps for improving our communication skills. But none of these will make a difference if the person communicating is deceptive or honest. Dishonest. Dishonest, sorry. Uh, so our discussion tonight is, if you have not learned this by now, you should know that some people lie. They do not always tell the truth. They tell untruths, they tell stories, they fabricate or make up things. According to Proverbs 6, 16 and 19, there are seven, thing that, seven things that God hates or detests. One of them is a lying tongue. Proverbs 12 and 22 says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. And so... Reading that and based on hearing when you hear messages and when you hear uh, I'll use feed my sheep here for an example. When Pastor Washington is teaching us at, at any given time, whether it's just sitting around the dinner table and helping us to understand that there are things that are an abomination to God. And so helping us to understand that when we open our mouth to speak, mm -hmm. it should be of truth. It should be of whatever the word says. It should not be influenced by worldly situations. I remember a long time ago, Pastor Washington shared with us, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it had to do with uh, Jerry Springer. And she said, if everybody's doing it and everybody's talking about it, then it can't be right. And at that time, everybody was on Jerry Springer. But if you looked at Jerry Springer, you saw all the different things and the different shows that they were there. None of them had any good coming out of those types of shows. So we shouldn't be associated with those. Our conversation. You know, we talk about a lot of different times the, the, the conversation in the morning at work around the water cooler. Well, if it's an ungodly conversation, then you can't participate. You don't have, if, you, if you're not in the conversation, again, to enlighten, enrich, edify, or, you know, bring something positive to that conversation, that should not be a conversation that we should be a part of. And yeah. I have my kind of parts here, Missionary Lewis and Pastor Washington, if y'all want to interject anything. 
<laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, it's a very good lesson to understand. You know, it speaks of in the Bible says that uh, don't let your good communication be spoken evil of. Mm-hmm. And so it's necessary that we guard what comes out of our mouth. But we can't guard that until we uh, filter what's going through our mind. Amen. Because Amen. what's in the heart is, is, is and what's in your mind is is usually what's going to come out. And usually when things are said that shouldn't be said, we say, I didn't mean to say that. But the reality is with everything in you got to come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we have to uh, uh, study to make sure that our environment is conducive to what we believe and what we talk about. And so if we're not uh, infiltrating our environment with things that are uh, ungodly, things that are contrary to the word of God in every uh, retrospect, or even allowing people to come in and dump their ungodly stuff in the midst of of, of, of your worship space, mm-hmm. then y- y- we're able to live the way we're supposed to live. Mm-hmm. And our communication won't be spoken evil of. Amen. And so, and that means in every manner. So it's not just talking about what's coming out of our mouth, but it's talking about our whole uh, being. You know, I, we've been talking about legacy quite a bit here. And this is a legacy that we can, every last one of us, under the sound of my voice and everyone here and, and abroad, that we can build a legacy in each one of our lives that glorifies God in our speaking. And we're talking about speech on tonight. Amen. Amen. I think about the scripture that you talked about a few moments ago, Ephesians 4 and 29. You read it. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. There's a lot of chatter going on that's contrary to building people up, edifying the body of Christ, Mm -hmm. edifying your family, edifying on your job. You know, when we go into an atmosphere that is clean and holy, there's a certain reverence that we have for that if we have any kind of moral values. Uh, But... In this day and time, it's very difficult to find that atmosphere even within the home. Mm -hmm. We must be careful with what we say and how we say it because we're influencing everyone in the home to they're either going to go with us the way we're doing it or they're going to go away from us. And you have many times you hear children say, my parents did this, my parents did that. Mm -hmm. And their actions that they took many times through their words influenced the negative or the positive choices that the child made based on their environment. Mm-hmm. Well, so it is in the church, so it is on the job and everywhere. We all have testimonies of when we walked in godliness and we may not have been using the thus and the thou's or the King James Version or whatever, but it's just a common part of our conversation, our actions and our the things that people would see us do. They, they respect us for our belief. Mm-hmm. And it makes a difference. So you can see why the scripture would warn us that we are not to let uh, corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth as children of God. Amen. Amen. Can I share one more thing? I was thinking about as Pastor Wise was speaking, they're so very true. It ties back to even the scripture we started out with, uh, where the part got down when, uh, when Jesus cast that uh, spirit out of that young boy and the crowd looked and they thought he was presumably was dead. Mm-hmm. So basically, most, most likely they thought was he ain't got no power. Uh-huh. Because of it, you know, because of what because he, he said, couldn't do. And, uh-huh. right? And based on what they saw with their naked eye, mm-hmm. and so we used to have a saying that first impression makes a difference, it, and, and so we have does. to, yes, it does, mm-hmm. and so we have to be careful about what we say out of our mouth. Amen. You know, and good intentions is is, is not enough. Amen. We have yeah. to be guarded. You know, I thought about what Pastor Watson said that some time ago. Someone said, "You you very guarded." Mm-hmm. Well, thank God for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And we're Christians. Our character and our nature should emulate Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, the fate of liars is clearly spelled out in God's word. In Psalm 101, verse 7, God says, He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Hmm. Proverbs 19 and 5 says, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. And Revelation 21 and 8 says that all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. So, in other words, in layman's terms, as I see this, three things that these scriptures are telling us is that if you lie, God don't see you. You're not in his sight. He's not paying you any attention. Number two, that if you are a liar, you can believe that it will not go unpunished unless you repent. (laughs) Okay? Mm -hmm. And... 
The third thing is that if you continue down that path, it's telling you what your destiny is going to be. Amen. So Amen. the application. Well, before we go into right. that, I, I think it's real important for us to understand, help people to understand what lying is. Because lying shows up in so many ways. And we've been talking about the lying tongue and, and uh, the character that we should walk in. Because it's about our character. It's about your trustworthiness. When you are a liar, you're not worthy to be trusted. People mm -hmm. can't trust you. We have so many uh, relationships that fail because of lying. Relationships of all sort, not just a male and female, a husband and wife, but of all sort that fail because of the lying, the manipulation, the deceiving. Mm -hmm. All of that is forms of lies and any, uh, any other thing that you could think of where you're hiding the truth. Mm, or where you are going against the truth. Those are lies. And see, people, many people are deceived because this world system supports lying one to another. Mm -hmm. This you get, you get a job and they'll give you a script that's a lie and you're supposed to say it every day to whomever you speak to, no matter what the situation is. And many of us have experienced that and we're trying to reason with a person and they're telling us the exact same lie that we know is a lie and because we've done this on our own jobs before or, or we've been asked to do it and some of us uh, rejected it, but the truth is most people don't reject it. You have to have uh, secu be secure in your relationship with Christ before you will even do it. And so as we look at this lesson, we see that it's calling to uh, our attention, our character, saying yes and meaning yes to God. That's our subject on tonight. Mm -hmm. When we say yes to the Lord, we can't walk with corrupt communication being a part of our life. And while it may be common or normal, or they're doing it on TV, or they're doing it at this, this church, or they're doing it at that church, it, see, it really doesn't matter where they're doing it at. Mm -hmm. What matters is that we turn from these ways that are uh, natural for us to do in this earth realm and, and you know, common for us to do, Amen. and become uncommon, become holy. You know, the word holy is the opposite of common. Because it's going to be like God. And then our conversation is supposed to be like God. Now, I think a lot of times, I mentioned it earlier, where people get mixed up, they think they have to speak with the dusts and dolls and whatever. And there was a time when I thought that's what, because I, I reverenced God, but I had a misunderstanding. And if you don't have a clear understanding, you will do things to the contrary. But we can really talk. Of, of the goodness and, and speak the way God would want us to speak in every situation, no matter what, even when we're angry, even when we're hurt, even when we're frustrated. You know, a lot of people in those type of circumstances, they don't want to utilize the nature of Christ. They want to cut somebody off. Mm -hmm. They want to shoot the finger. They want to say something ugly to that person because there's a certain good feeling of power that comes with that. But as a child of God, you got to humble yourself. Amen. Under the mighty hand of God. And your, your character and your nature should reflect the moral values that you have because you are a child of God. I was just saying that I think about two different instances that I encountered at work. One, we're having to read a script and being knowing that we were being recorded. Um, and every time I looked around, my supervisor was in my office saying, stick to the script. But I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And another instance where I had my supervisor actually tell me that I need you to call this customer and tell them such and such, which was a a lie. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, told them I couldn't do that. Amen. I, I Amen. just I couldn't and we, do it. And that's, why, that's where the holy boldness come in. That's where being filled with the spirit of God come in. You know that you labor for God. You're his child. And so you stay with his word. You Like you said earlier, there's no little lies and big lies and white lies and black lies and all this stuff like the world said. It's lying and it's contrary to God. And the Bible, you just read the scripture, reveals that God hates that. Amen. Um, our application. Make no mistake about it. God says what he means and means what he says. And he wants you to be the same way. That gives you comfort and understanding that God's word is true. As it mm -hmm. says, he says what he means and he means what he says. And we can count on that. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing for the for us believers. We can That's count right. on his word. Amen. When God says yes, he means yes. He does not say yes when he really means no. <laughs> you should do likewise. Don't manufacture stuff. Don't formulate or fabricate. Say what you mean and mean what you say. If you want people to believe, I'm sorry, if you want people to believe you or believe the words that come out of your mouth, let your yes be yes, 
Let your yes mean yes. Don't ever say yes when you really mean no. Amen. You know, I want to say something right there as well. Uh, you, when we are being a witness unto the Lord, we got to recognize that everybody's watching us. Mm-hmm. Whether you think you are mature enough or not, if you're saying you're a Christian, everyone is watching you. The people who are older you, older than you are mature, have been in the church longer, they're watching you. But also the people that's coming behind you are watching you, as well as the people who are walking along beside you are watching you. And we are to project the nature of Christ. Jesus said you should know the tree by the fruit that he bears. So it's, it's not a putting on airs or pretending or hypocrisy. We're living this. So we're not liars. We're, we're not uh, busybodies. We're not gossipers. We're not, none of those things that are contrary to the word of God. As Elder Lewis was reading the second paragraph, he says, when God says yes, he means yes. He does not say yes when he really means no. You should do likewise. Don't manufacture stuff. Don't for, formulate or fabricate. These are tests or things that we can put in place to make sure I'm not going to manufacture nothing. I'm not going to fabricate. I'm not going to manipulate and I say that because I remember when I used to be a person who would start talking and why I would not lie, generally speaking, I would manipulate the conversation. And that's a tactic that a lot of people still use today. Even many preachers, if you watch them and you listen to them, now we're not condemning preachers, but certainly if you're a preacher, you should not be manipulating people with your words. But people do it. But husbands do it. Wives do it. Children do it. It should not be done. But it is very common and it causes defects in relationships across the board mm-hmm. because it is lying. Regardless of what you call it or regardless of your reason for doing it, it is still lying. Mm-hmm. And we're thinking that we can do <clears throat> these things without there being a recompense or reward. But many of relationships have been destroyed where the child can't take the car anymore because of what they said they was going to do and they didn't do it. They they told a half truth, as you say. They fabricated a lie. They knew what they were going to be doing, but they didn't. And so now they can't take the car anymore or, or so on, no matter what type of relationships it is. And oftentimes we're not thinking what's being destroyed. Even if we look at in that example I gave about the child that just came to me, think about what God said, that you should honor your parents. If you are fabricating a lie to your parents, you are not honoring your parents. Mm-hmm. Now, whether you did that at 16 and now you're 60, or you did that at 45 and now you're 46, it, it's still the same before God because God mm-hmm. knows it all. He has a record of all. Mm-hmm. He There's going to be a judgment, a recompense, a reward, and we don't consider that. We should serve him because we worship him and love him by not lying or doing the other abomination that he talks about. But certainly if we know that there's a recompense or reward, that we get separated from the blessing or, or we don't get receive what God has given us when we disobey, we should certainly be obedient to his will and, and make a decision that we're not going to be liars, and manipulators, deceivers, and all of this. To be a deceiver or to be a liar is emulating or being just like Satan. The Bible says he's the father of liars. Mm-hmm. The father of liars. Yes. In 2 Corinthians 1, 16 through 20, the Apostle Paul taught this and used himself as an example. He started off by saying in verse 17, according to the New Living Translation, that he was not like those people who said yes when they really meant no. In the next verse, he said, as surely as God is true, I am not that sort of a person. My yes means yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. What can you say? I'm sorry. Can you say the same thing? Can you distinguish yourself from the perpetrators or the folks who say one thing when they really mean something else? Mm -hmm. Can you say I am not that sort of person? My yes means yes. Paul went on to give the reason why he said what he meant and meant what he said. He stated that when Jesus came on the scene, he never wavered between yes and no. In him was yes, or what the New Living Transfer, New Living Translation refers to as the divine yes. But Paul really brought it home when he said, For all the promises of God in him are yea, 
the NIV says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And we'll find that in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. I'm going to get to a little note, side note that I wrote here. It says, uh, still in the book, it says, this is why we should always mean what we say when we say yes to God. Yeah. It is because he has already said yes to us in Christ. Yeah. That side yeah. note I have is, what if Christ said yes to us, then mm. he turned around and said, sorry, I changed my mind. Mm. What if Christ made it all the way to the cross and said, nope, I'm going back home to heaven. They can deal with this on their own. Mm. And that, you know, that again, even if you, even in thinking of that, you know, understanding that we've already said that for the believer, it's a good thing that we can trust God's word, that mm -hmm. we know that his word says yes and amen and so be it and you can have it yeah. and all those good things. And also understanding that, you know, he let us know when we get off, these are the things that, that you'd have to have to come to also. Mm -hmm. So I know time is upon us and I just want to go ahead and hit a couple of the questions real quick. It says, which of the four opening scriptures that I read in the introduction really hit home with you and why? Just look. Uh, I, I, I mean, all of them, uh, as far as speaking of them, I try to live my life according to what is stated in the scripture. Um, but I guess it's one that I speak of frequently is James 1 and 19. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Um, the only way that this will be possible, in my opinion, is that we would have to be sold out to God. Mm -hmm. Because the otherwise, uh, if you're not, the first uh, one that's going to, of these characters that's going to exhibit itself is going to be wrath, anger. Because we don't like to be told anything as a human being. We don't like to be told things that, are, uh, that we know is right, mm -hmm. but we're not doing. Uh, if that's the best way to say it. When mm -hmm. I look at this here, um, we know naturally speaking that it's not right to lie. Mm -hmm. But we find that many times people are not only exaggerating, but they overstating. Mm -hmm. It's still a lie. One of the things we used to talk about in, in uh, I learned through schooling, and it says a lie is a lie is a lie. Mm -hmm. And let you know that as Elder Lewis spoke earlier, there's no white lie, no, no uh, any other color that you want to call it. And what I found is that when we make a determination uh, that we're going to live for God and that uh, we're going to guard our space, so mm -hmm. to speak. And when I say guard space, I don't mean become uh, isolated from other people. Right. I mean, be careful about what you take in. And what you take, let out. And what you let out. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what we're saying. Then you're going to be careful about what you're saying. Yeah. And so, as Elder Lewis mentioned at the top of this uh, broadcast, I am one that listen to what you say, and then I watch. Mm -hmm. And and the reason why there's not to try to find that you are a liar, but your words can betray you, uh, betray you mm -hmm. if you don't do the thing that you said you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And most often, what people don't do, sometimes you're not gonna be able to reach a certain. Night. For example, you might say, um, "I'll be there at ten o'clock," and some traffic accident or something happened, and you can't get there at ten. Logic thing to do which would be the honorable thing to do is to call ahead and mm -hmm. let them know I plan to be there at 10 o'clock. Well, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it due to traffic mm -hmm. situations. But today, we don't have that. We have people show up two hours later, 30 minutes later, 10 minutes later, mm -hmm. don't call ahead, got a person waiting prepared, waiting for them. Mm -hmm. And so what that does, whether it's spoken out of that in the, that person that's waiting his mouth or not, it is formulating an opinion about that person's character. Mm -hmm. And what, what a lot of times when people say, well, I couldn't help it, you know, but you could have helped the situation. Yes. You may not have been able to help the delay, but the lie, what caused it to become a lie is that you didn't intervene in your own situation to let the other person. Now, if it was a situation where you had a wreck or something, you couldn't do it, then mm -hmm. you couldn't do it. So that, that goes back to what I said earlier. The lying has to do with your character. Mm -hmm. This is what God is talking about. When he hates a lie, your character is to be godly. Mm -hmm. Be holy and acceptable unto him. And I'm going to jump right here because I know time is almost over as well for this evening. But I'm going to look at the New International Version and in Colossians, the fourth chapter and the uh, sixth verse. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, 
seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I chose that one on the King James Version. It's just worded a little bit differently, but the, I want to focus on the fact that the scripture is urging us that our conversation is filled with grace, mm -hmm. always. What is that favor? That's, that's uh, using the power of God within your conversation. And it's not just the words you say, even though we're talking a lot about lying, and, but we also talk about the actions that, mm -hmm. that go with it. So we're talking about both word and deed. And so that others will be able to hear what we say. Sometimes because it lacks the seasoning, we others cannot hear what we're saying. We're too, either too harsh or too cynical or we're making a joke out of everything. Some type of something that's involved in what we're saying that changes the, the, the power of it, changes the affect that it could have on our life. Mm -hmm. So we've got to learn how to do it in a way where we're seasoned. To where we can, you know, we use terms like the seasoned man or the seasoned woman. Mm -hmm. It means that person who has grown and who has learned and who's embraced the character and the nature of God and walking like Jesus in this earth realm where they're bold in the Lord and his power. But at the same time, there's a gentle kindness that where they're, what does the scripture say, uh, harmless as dove, but shrewd as serpents. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not walking in ignorance or, or inability, but I show love while I'm doing it because mm -hmm. I'm harmless as a dove. And I, this is going to be my last question, and I interject my, my answer and turn it over. One of the worst things that can be said about the saints is that they lie. In our modern-day culture, it has become all right to tell a white lie. What is your position on this? Oh, I so, think we've covered that. But. Yeah, I just simply said there's no such thing as a white lie or a little lie or anything else that excuses a lie because that's what they're looking for excuses a lie is a lie and at no time should we lie amen amen, amen. and i turn it back into the hands of pastor Washington. amen well i just thank god for you all joining us over the world wide web i thank god for feed my sheep ministries church give yourself a hand praise you have been doing great and awesome in the things of god and i'm just thankful uh to be one that god has called to lead you in this hour you all are champions I thank God for what he's doing in this earth realm today, even with these type of messages that we first started off with, I believe and help my unbelief. See, when you move to the place that you humble yourself to allow the Lord to help you in your unbelief, then you'll go into the place where your yes will be yea, yes, and your nays will be nays, and you'll just tell the truth. You won't be harsh or hard-hearted. You'll, you'll be full of grace and full of mercy as God is, and you'll be sharing with others, but in truth. You know, you won't say, well, I'm going to pray about it when you know you've already made a decision. You will simply uh, say, you, you know, I, I've got to see if I can arrange it because that's a more appropriate answer anyway. Uh, or I've got to wait and see what it's going to be like. You know, tell the truth in love. That's what our uh, commission is. Amen. 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 We thank God for you being here tonight and we're praying for you. And we thank God for this opportunity to serve you with the word of God. We pray that the Spirit of God come into your house right now where you are. And anyone who is not saved would be saved based on the word that they heard tonight. Anyone who is not filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost based on the word that they heard tonight. Anyone who is not delivered in any area, be delivered from anything that's attacking you from any perspective. We believe God. We believe the word of God. We believe the power of God is available to everyone who would believe father bless these children your children around this world that's heard this word encourage their hearts and thank you for blessing us and strengthening us and encouraging us we just give you glory and praise in jesus name we pray thank you lord amen amen amen, amen. again god bless you we thank god for your being here and we will see you on the next time be blessed thank you jesus <laughs>